My name's Simon Baldock, and this podcast is called Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity. It's the story of how I conquered my insecurities and shyness and went on to have a 35-year career in broadcasting, both in the UK and in Spain. You'll hear some of my most memorable celebrity interviews and all the adventures I've had and the stories behind them. Like the time I delivered half a carcass of beef to Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street and the time I carried a million pounds worth of diamonds on the tube in an old Sainsbury's bag on the way to a photo shoot with Lord Snowden at the Ritz. This week's episode of Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity, I'll tell you about a trip of a lifetime when in 1982 I went to Spain and saw a World Cup semi-final, World Cup final and the Rolling Stones in concert. And you'll also hear an interview I did with former Stones bassist Bill Wyman, who had some very interesting things to say about the early days with the band. I'm going to split the interview into two parts because it's, well, it's quite chunky and I want to play it all because he's a very good talker, as you're about to find out in part one. Wyman was with the Stones from 1962 right at the beginning through to 1993 and he famously kept a journal since he was a child and has published seven books, one of which he was promoting when I interviewed him. He started by telling me what it was like playing with such an iconic band. Well, it's a good buzz and a lot of fun, obviously, because um, that's what you do it for. It's the rest of the time that's a nightmare, you know, the other 22 hours of the day and maybe the two more days as well because you only tend to play like uh, three gigs a week or sometimes even two. Mm. It's not like every night like I do with the Rhythm Kings or like we did in the old days, you know, when you was out there doing gigs every night, doing uh, recordings during the afternoon and doing interviews, photo sessions, uh, and all that sort of stuff with the magazines in the mornings and then traveling to Sheffield to do two shows. You know, it was a non-stop. It's not like that anymore. If you're not physically on the stage, the rest of it can become pretty dull and boring, actually. You can't go out the hotel because of the people out there, fans and that. So you get stuck in this hotel room for three days, basically. You end up just watching these boring things on television and, and new commercials and things. And it gets very dull. Um, it isn't as glamorous as people think. It's nowhere near, actually. And, and Charlie encapsulated it, you know, years ago when he um, was asked one question. He said, I'll ask, answer one question. After 20 years of refusing to talk to the press, he said, I'll answer one question. And they said, what's it like being in the Rolling Stones for 25 years? And Charlie just said, five years work and 20 years hanging around. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said it in one sentence, you know. Well, anybody in the music business knows, <laughs> but he has a way of doing those kind of things. That's why we all love him. But people are still striving to follow in your footsteps. Mm. Yeah, but they don't put the work in, you know. This band, when we started, the same as the Beatles and all those bands in the early 60s, you never stopped working, you know. In a year, you probably had 10 days off if you were lucky. You worked every night and you were up and down the country and you were abroad and it was like that continuously. Sometimes you didn't get any sleep overnight. Sometimes you drove from Norfolk to Aberystwyth in Wales overnight, you know, mm. and then did the gig and then went straight from there up to Birmingham or somewhere or Manchester or something to do a TV show next morning uh, without sleep, without food and, and breaking down without fuel outside of Hereford and places like that, you know, because there weren't all those many... Uh, sort of garages on the motorways in those days. Well, that, there weren't that many motorways, actually. No. And um, it was horrendous, you know. So when I hear about bands of today, like they, they they got an eight-gig tour of America or something, and after three gigs, they're all tired and they come home. So these bands of the 60s used to really, really break, you know, do that apprenticeship and really work their butts off, you know, to achieve what they did. Which bands did you admire most back in, you know, at the beginning in the 60s? In those days? Yeah. Uh, Hollies we were always very friendly with. We met them the very first time we played outside of London, out of the clubs. We went up to Middlesbrough and played at this club up there. And uh, the Hollies, we, we were on with the Hollies and they were a bit scared of us and we were a bit scared of them because they'd have had hits and they'd heard about us down south. 
and they didn't know what to expect and when they saw us they had a bit of a fit you know as everybody did <laughs> and thought oh, a load of thugs or something you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um we, we became great mates and they toured with us on many occasions other bands spencer davis when they first came out they toured with us when they first had the first record and we got very f- good friends with them bands like that the, the bands we didn't like are easy to remember Freddie and the Dreamers, Dave Clark Five, <laughs> Herman's Hermits, uh, all those kind of, they were horrible, you know, they just didn't cut it on stage, they were a load of wimps and wallies, you know, they, were, uh, they really were not uh, not what you'd call quality at all, you know, we liked the animals, we yeah. liked the Who, of course, the Paramounts used to tour with us, they became Procol Harum, mm. um, right from the early days, they were good mates, you know, we always got on well with Gary Brooker and them guys, and I, I mean, I Gary's been in my band on and off for three or four years, the Rhythm Kings. Uh, so, and he was in Willie and the Poor Boys in the 80s with me. So those things continue. You know, you, you have your your mates and your nice people. Georgie Fame was always a nice bloke, you know, even when he played jazz and we played blues and we were the young upstarts in those days. He still had a nice soft spot for us and he always used to say hello and that. He was very sweet. So those friendships continue over the years you know just because you remember oh he was nice in those days you know yeah bill wyman and the second part of that interview is coming up very shortly So, it's July 1982, I'm about to celebrate my 23rd birthday, the Falklands War had ended around a month earlier, and I found myself on my way to Spain with around 50 publicans and four paratroopers to watch one of the World Cup semi-finals and the World Cup final, and unbeknownst to me at the time, I'd also see, yes, the Rolling Stones in concert as well. Not a bad way to celebrate a birthday, and it turned out to be one of the best weeks of my life. So, how did I come to get an invite to Spain to the World Cup Finals? Well, my dad used to work for a brewery, who were one of the main sponsors of the England squad back then. As part of the sponsorship, the company were given tickets to give out to publicans and special guests to all of England's home matches. Because of my connection, I used to get a couple of complimentary tickets, but more excitingly got to go to the after-match dinner where the England players would all turn up for a couple of hours to chat to us guests and to sign countless autographs and smile politely as they answered the same questions over and over again. It was the era of Kevin Keegan, Ray Clements, Trevor Brooking, Glenn Hoddle and Brian Robson to name just a few. I think I went to every home game for a whole season. They were, in truth, usually dire 1-0 affairs, but the thought of the after-game hospitality got us through it. Anyway, again, as part of the sponsorship deal, the company were also allocated a certain number of tickets for the 1982 World Cup Finals in Spain. The tickets included one semi-final and the big one, yes, the final itself, in the hope that England would, of course, feature in one or both. Yes, we were living in dreamland even then. In fact, England had a very good World Cup. After five games, they'd not lost. They'd scored six and only conceded one goal. On paper, a fantastic tournament. And yet they were heading home after drawing nil-nil with Spain, a game they had to win to progress. In the end, England lost out to West Germany, who went on to face France in one of the semi-finals. And that was the first game I saw, which turned out to be one of the best in footballing history. 3-3 after extra time, and then the Germans won by a penalty shootout to set up a final against Italy, which the Italians won 3-1. The final wasn't a patch on the semi-final game, but it was more than made up by the fantastic atmosphere in the Santiago Bernabeu Stadium in Madrid, in front of 90,000 people. The noise was deafening when the two teams came onto the pitch and throughout the game, and was only matched by another game I went to, AC Milan versus Inter Milan, in around 1990, where the opposing fans actually fired rockets at each other and I got to spend a very enjoyable dinner with Frank Reichard, regarded as one of the best midfielders in footballing history. Anyway, as I mentioned, I was in Spain with around 50 publicans, who were great fun, all of whom had been chosen through a lottery, and also with us were the four paratroopers who had been slightly wounded in the Falklands conflict, and they were invited along as a bit of PR for the company. 
They were amazing guys, and we were glad to have them with us because there was quite a bit of animosity towards us from the Spanish, who a large number of which sided with the Argentinians. Our coach was pelted with eggs a number of times, and the paras almost got into a fight in a nightclub. But apart from that, it wasn't too bad, and we certainly felt safer with them around. But it was one of them that spotted an advert for a Rolling Stones concert that was happening the following day, and he suggested that we rock up to see if we could get in. So the following night, that's exactly what we did. Around ten of us just turned up a couple of hours before the concert and went to the ticket office and bought ten tickets there and then. We couldn't believe it. We were sure it was going to be sold out, and judging by the number of people in the open air stadium, it must have been almost full. But they must have held back some tickets for the night, and we were lucky enough to get some. It was a lovely warm evening. The band were on top form.、Uh, the warm-up band was. Yep, the Jay Giles band. They were great as well. And the fact that we got in, it was just a lovely surprise to add to what was already a great week. So this is a good time to hear part two of the interview with Bill Wyman. I was keen to hear about some of his highlights playing with the band. Is it possible to say what is the the highest point in your career with the Rolling Stones when you thought you know life doesn't doesn't get any better than this? When I left. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I was very proud of my time with the Stones. I I really was. I'm not putting them down at all, and I still wouldn't because.、Um, I admire everything we did. We broke countless records, and we broke rules and regulations which don't exist anymore, so people can take advantage of it. You know, but in those days, it was so hard work. Elvis had the same problem in America. You know, in those days, we used to stay at a hotel, maybe in like Bristol or somewhere, the Grand Hotel or one of those, and we weren't allowed to walk through the hotel unless we wore jacket and ties, and we didn't have jackets and ties. You know, so we couldn't walk in the hotel. We had to go out th- up through the, I mean, staff quarters entrances and the laundry、uh, exit in the back and all that. And they wouldn't let you eat in their restaurant, so you used to have to go down and buy fish and chips down the road. But you were paying top whack for their their rooms, you know, and and you'd go in pubs and they'd refuse to serve you. In, in just a regular pub, buzzing with people, and they say we're shut, we're closed, you know, and and we used to try to buy cigarettes in cigarette shops. They wouldn't serve us. It was quite horrendous in those days. So anything you did、um, uh, that was acclaimed was a, a big achievement. But I, I suppose if you talk about one of the best events ever, it was probably the Hyde Park concert. Really, on, on a beautiful summer day in July '69, when、um, the whole of London really closed down. There was nobody on the street shopping. I mean, there was、uh, close on half a million people in the park. It was just from right in front of you to the horizon in every direction you could look. To the far horizon was just a carpet of heads of different coloured hair going in every direction up in the trees. Now it was、uh, stunning. There wasn't any violence. There was no fighting, no problems. It just went off beautifully, and、uh, I can't forget it. You know, because、uh, it was a really fantastic thing. Since leaving the Rolling Stones, Bill Wyman has recorded and toured with his own band, Bill Wyman Rhythm Kings. He's worked producing records and films, and has scored music for films and television. He's also a photographer, and his works have been displayed in galleries around the world. He became an amateur archaeologist and enjoys metal detecting, and he even designed and marketed a Bill Wyman metal detector. Yep, absolutely, which he has used to find relics in the English countryside dating back to the era of the Roman Empire. How rock and roll is that? Well, that's it for this week. Now, in the first episode of this series, you heard an interview I did with Dame Judi Dench, which I described as one of the worst interviews I ever did, and it was. Next week, you're going to hear what I consider to be one of the best that I did, and was featured on BBC Radio 4's Pick of the Week, the long-running radio program, which features extracts of some of the best BBC radio programs broadcast over the previous seven days. Needless to say, to be featured is quite a big thing when you consider the amount of material. The BBC airs each week, so I was really chuffed. The interview is with Fatima Whitbread, the former javelin thrower, who won a couple of Olympic medals and a host of other medals as well. But it wasn't that we spoke about. It was her very tough childhood, living in children's homes, and includes her description of meeting her biological mother for the very first time. 
my image was totally different from that of the, the biological mother that arrived that morning. And of course, a very large lady, foreign speaking, who didn't have a smile to give to me and, and smelt terrible of what I call cheap scent. Even now, yeah, I can still vividly yeah. see that image. Really what killed it for me was when we went down to Ockendon in that period that it took us to drive um, from, from Hertfordshire down to Ockendon. Um, I spent most of the time looking out the window crying. Of course, when we got to the home, we sort of introduced and my introduction was uh, in the garden um, and the biological mother said, this is your half-sister, you better look after her I'm going to cut your throat. That's next week on Tales from a Very Minor Celebrity.